Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Caroline Bowman. Hello again, I'm back. What an amazing night we have lined up for you as we celebrate the brilliant designers, thank you, whose innovative ideas and creative projects have brought us together. I'd like to acknowledge not only the amazing jurors, but also all of those who have selected such stellar designers to be part of the National Design Awards family. Let's take a look behind the scenes and see what the jurors had to say about the process. We're looking at such an amazing number of submissions. Architecture, interiors, landscape, fashion. So you walk into the room and there's a table full of portfolios. We vote, we put stickers next to the ones that rise to the top. You see the, the debate, you see even the oh, a little so, bit of the friction. It was so, so wonderful. Yeah, it's because passionate. everyone cares. Everyone cares about design. It's about the entire breadth of design. It's not about one discipline or one form of design. Fashion designer speaks very differently about architecture. A product designer speaks very differently about some graphic design. But at the same time, there's, there's ideas that connect them all together. The depth and, and lineage of experience on the jury is humbling, to say the least. Especially that we did receive uh, one of the awards. You realize, oh my god, all that went into picking us. That's true. <gasps> We all recognize when there was a clarity of concept, there was a commitment to create something innovative. Many of us take design extraordinarily seriously because it has such a, a dramatic impact in how people live their lives. Because it is the Smithsonian Institution, the bar is set very high. It's actually super interesting to me that it's in a museum because essentially what you're saying for the rest of time is that this exemplifies something good at this moment. The awards remind the entire country that design is important and design is part of your everyday life. And any particular award, you go back and look at its recipients over a decade or two and you go, oh, they got quite a few of them right. All the designers that we chose today have had an impact, not only on their own field, but also an amazing impact on the society. Over these past 14 years, we've awarded 132 National Design Awards. Would all National Design Award honorees and jurors, past and present, please stand so that we may recognize you. and the alumni family is growing. Now, our first award of the evening, Design Patron. Recognizing enlightened leaders and their patronage of good design, Cooper Hewitt is honored to award Jeanette Sadi Khan, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation, as this year's Design Patron. Jeanette has revolutionized our transportation landscape since her appointment in 2007. Cooper Hewitt had the great privilege of working with Jeanette in 2008 on the City Racks design competition. Some of you may have seen the bicycle racks exhibited in our garden. It makes me so happy to see the winning rack being used throughout the city today. Jeanette is truly reinventing how we live and work in the city through increased mobility and safety measures, including more bus and bike lanes, and of course, City Bike, New York's new bike share program that has already provided. <laughs> and I love these numbers, that has already provided nearly 4.5 million trips across almost 9 million miles since May 28th. Is that possible? And we're adding 665 more riders to those outstanding numbers. Folks, tonight, 
you will all go home with day passes thanks to City and New York City Bike Share. So get out those bike shorts. Let's take a look. You know, city planning, I think, is in the DNA of every New Yorker. So whether you get it in a book, you know, pick it off a shelf, uh, it is part of uh, every New Yorker's experience. You know, you walk every day. Uh, New Yorkers take the train, they take the bus, they drive. Uh, we are all experiencing the city and the urban planning of that city uh, 365 days a year. Um, my real interest in the streets stems from my mom. Uh, who I walked around with ever since I was young, uh, looking at the streets. She's the person that always talked to the garbage men and thanked them for their work and always encouraged me to look up, to look up, to look up, and not get so involved in your own conversation to really, you know, see what's around you and uh, observe that ballet of the streets. Sometimes that feels like more warfare than ballet, but it really was a really important part of my uh, learning uh, and what I brought to this position. Cooper Hewitt is thrilled to honor Jeanette Sadi Khan. Jeanette. Great. Uh, well, thank you all, and I want to thank the National Design Award jury uh, for this incredible honor, which I accept on behalf of the New York City Department of Transportation. Um, as you all know, we live in an urban age, and how we design our city and how we design our city streets uh, matters, not only for the millions of people that are here today, uh, but the millions more that are going to come here uh, in the years ahead. And in cities, our streets are where we live, work, and play. They're really our front yards. And the way they look and the way they feel matters. You wouldn't design your home to be unsafe or unattractive or uncomfortable. And our streets should be held to no less standard. And until a few years ago, uh, I don't even think we had the design vocabulary to talk about pedestrian plazas, bike share, wayfinding. And today, uh, that's a part of the common language of New Yorkers. And, and they're embracing that. And, and it's increasingly echoing uh, around the world. So there are 4,500 planners and designers and roadway workers at New York City DOT who made this happen, along with the incredible vision and the political courage of Mayor Michael Bloomberg, who was there when we took a few pot shots uh, a long way, <laughs> yes. And I think that they showed that good design saves lives and it creates prosperity and it improves the quality of life of a city. And I wanna say that it's really exciting to see uh, the expanded definition of design uh, recognized here tonight and it's a real testament to the National Design uh, Award. And many thanks to the Cooper Hewitt, uh, to the Smithsonian, uh, and the Design Awards for recognizing uh, and celebrating the achievements uh, of New York City DOT. And I also want to pass along incredible congratulations uh, to the, our fellow awardees. Thank you. Congratulations again, Jeanette. We have a remarkable group of presenters lined up for you tonight. So now, on with the show. Here to present the Fashion Design Award, model Electra Wiedemann. Thank you. Just over six years ago, I was part of a small group of people to put together a fashion show in which we challenged designers to create a dress or outfit from sustainable materials. Everyone enthusiastically embraced this challenge, including Banaz. But what stood out about Banaz was the fact that she had already been developing her own organic materials for her regular collections for over a year. Not only that, Banaz made a point of showing that luxury design can be done locally in New York City and support the local economy. In my view, in order for sustainability to become the norm, it has to prove economically beneficial to the local and global economies and also, goods created by eco-friendly and sustainable means have to be able to compete in the marketplace with conventional luxury goods. 
Benaz has proven that this is possible and was well ahead of the curve. I am hugely pleased and proud to see her being honored and awarded tonight because Benaz is a true visionary and trailblazer. I have been a friend and fan of Benaz now for many years, but for those of you who aren't familiar with her work, here is a little video for you to see more. There is fashion and there are clothes, and they're two completely different things. Fashion is effective when it makes you feel something. I moved to New York to go to college in 1989, and that was very much towards sort of the tail end of a certain kind of nightlife in New York. A half of my day, which was, you know, spent in school and doing homework, and then there was my entire evening and nightlife, which was then going back to my dorm, spending like three hours getting made up like a drag queen and going to clubs all night. The whole reason you went out at night was to show off your look. <laughs> Um, so it wasn't going out for the sake of going out, but it was going out for the sake of showing your fashion statement. That kind of passion for expressing yourself through this medium was something that was very inspiring to me. Please welcome Benaz to the stage to get her award. <laughs> Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, I would like to thank Letra, first of all. Thank you for joining us here tonight and for your beautiful words. Um, and a big thank you to, first, the jurors of this year's competition for including my work in among such a talented group of designers. And um, very importantly, thank you to everyone at the Smithsonian and the Cooper Hewitt for making this evening happen, regardless of our government shutdown. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that um, although creating a fashion brand is often initiated by a designer, it is really never realized by the designer completely. Um, and for that, I have to thank the artisans who actually make the products I design the members of the press who bring it to the attention of the public, the buyers who make it accessible, and most importantly, in my case, the women who um, take my designs into their lives um, and use it as their own personal form of expression. Um, and um, lastly, I have to say a great thank you to my husband who is always by my side and has the patience to live with a designer. <laughs> thank you. Presenting the Design Mind Award, please welcome architecture critic of the New York Times, Michael Kimmelman. Hi. Um, it's an honor to be here, and uh, it's a really uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Michael Sorkin, who was just about the first person uh, I wanted to see when I moved back from Berlin to New York a couple of years ago. I, I wanted to see him because he already did what, what I wanted to do, as I would have wanted to do it. He wrote beautifully, fearlessly about big, overarching crusader themes like urban justice and public good, and he linked them to a fine-grained, very beautiful attention to physical details, and it came, of course, out of his profound knowledge as an architect. If you haven't read 20 Minutes in Manhattan, his Proustian meditation on neighborhoods, blocks, stairs, and streets, I recommend it highly. It picks up where Jane Jacobs left off. It happens to be about the streets and neighborhood where I grew up, where, where he lived for years. But Michael writes not out of nostalgia. His focus is on a better future. His commitment is to the abiding project of the city, and his forbearance for its inevitable evolution is rooted in his belief in the city's humane potential. He writes about a, quote, dialectic of equality and difference at the core of the struggle to find the form of a good city. It's at the core of his work as an architect and teacher as well. His firm has come up with a four-sided plan for a sustainable city of 300,000 near Wuhan, China, a 5,000-unit community in Penang, Malaysia, a town of 40,000 on the Black Sea in Turkey. His years-long 
radical thought experiment, New York City steady state, imagined an environmentally self-sufficient New York long before the rising tides of Sandy made the concept timely and pressing. I'm grateful for the smaller act of, of helping to keep me afloat, a teacher's generosity and true friend's kindness as I started to tiptoe in his footsteps. Michael's thinking has always been ahead of its time. Fortunately, time is now catching up as this award demonstrates. Michael, congratulations. There is probably a limit to the number of people who can survive on the surface of the Earth. It's the, the only planet we've got for the time being. We could breed a little slower and we could consume a little slower. Uh, you know, lots of people are talking about slow food and slow culture. And the statistic that's, th that's, that's thrown out, um, you know, is a statistic about um, the income gap on the planet. Um, we know that, for example, that if everybody on the planet were to consume at the rate at which we do, um, something between three and five additional planets would be required today uh, in order to supply their needs. So we in the developed world are definitely going to have to learn some good habits from people in the developing world who are able to live with less. You know, this, this sounds um, patronizing and colonial in one register. Uh, on the other hand, um, we need to make big changes in, in, the, way, in the way we live. And I, I don't think there's uh, enough technology in the mind of Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci to, to solve it that way. Thank you for those incredibly kind words, Michael. Um, I'd like to thank Harvey Weinstein, Sue Mengers, our truly incredible cast and crew. Oh, uh, wrong speech, sir. <clears throat> A paraphrase platitude. Knowledge is everywhere, and we meld productively with the minds of giants, dwarves, and those of average size. Among those to whom I am indebted, Callicrates and Ictinos, Sinon, my mother, for giving me a copy of Lewis Mumford when I was 14, my father for agreeing with my mother to buy that modernist house with no basement, Michael de Klerk, Alvar Alto, Bruce Goff, the more so for putting up with all that bullshit from Frank Lloyd Wright, um, <laughs> Lawrence Stern for the funniest book ever written, Guarino Guarini, James Wines for nominating me 28 times for this award, <laughs> Michelle Obama for the fabulous lunch, my dear wife Joan for her loving dissatisfaction, uncompromising mind and spirit, and inspirational good looks. Um, but I'd like to dedicate this award to two authentic mental titans we've lost this year. Comrades in arms, dear friends, more deserving than I of this tribute, Lebius Woods and Marshall Berman. <laughs> Leb, Leb taught me the true authenticity of genius, creative fearlessness, the league's long distance form can go, and the way in which ideas of the deepest profundity can live in architecture. He inspired me with design's power of resistance to constraint and with an ever unfolding and questioning dream of what building might be in both mind and place. Marshall taught me about the bottomless meaning that inhabits the city, the infinitely nuanced relations of thought and passion, the way in which politics can be a conduit for kindness and joy, and the pleasure and the contiguity of the astonishing urban poetries to be found from Aristotle's Agora to hip hop's Bronx. My great gratitude to the Cooper Hewitt and the NDA jury for conducing the sweetness and duty of thinking about what it means to have been alive among such minds as these. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the Corporate and Institutional Achievement Award, the 45th Vice President of the United States, Al Gore. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
They gave me 90 seconds. You know, even Ted gave me 18 minutes. <laughs> but really and truly, I, I am deeply and personally honored to have an opportunity to present this award tonight. I love Ted. And for those of you who have experienced Ted, uh, it's an extraordinary opportunity. A and like many of you, I get invited to a lot of conferences and events and multi-day gatherings. Ted's the only one that I've just made up my mind, no matter what, I I'm just not going to miss it. And I want to emphasize that Ted, the D in Ted, stands for design. And the superior performance of Ted, its absolute excellence, has been based in significant part on its appreciation for, love for, and outstanding achievements in design. Some seven years ago, I had the pleasure of attending TED for the first time and speaking at that event. It was still pretty small at that time. And I was very happy that mine was one of the first six talks put online. Since then, TED has become the preeminent global clearinghouse for the world's best talks, most exciting ideas, and inspirational thought leaders. Today, TED Talks have been watched by over a, bil over a billion times. I started to say by how many people, but they've been watched over a billion times in a hundred languages. So while our world is entering a time of unprecedented challenges, it is the spirit that led to the excellence at TED that enables us to prevail through the free and open exchange of ideas. And it is organizations like TED, though none is really like TED, that inspire us to rise to the occasion. I'm going to present the award in a minute, but first let's take a look at what uh, Chris Anderson and June Cohen have to say. So TED viewed one way, um, is there to celebrate a really, really weird human ability. Uh, it's this ability to hold the world in your head or a piece of the world in your head and play with it and tweak it and reposition it until you come up in your mind with a better world. Um, we sometimes call that invention or innovation or imagination, um, but really it's design. That's what it is. So we have a conference which, for whatever reason, people um, seem to get excited by. And, and I think it's because of that, because you, you spend days immersed with people who can do that really well, who can excite you with their reimagination of the future. For years now, we've been following what we've called our philosophy of radical openness, and that began with Chris's decision to really open the conference up to the world, and has really become a several year long experiment in what openness can do to an organization and to the ideas themselves. And so everything that we've done since um, really over the last eight to 10 years has been to figuring out how can we open ourselves up more? How can we allow our community to build with us, which is a really kind of fascinating design challenge for our time. Chris, congratulations. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Al. Uh, it was very generous. You, of course, uh, are the master of the concise acceptance speech. I think it was at the Webbies where they limit speeches to five words. Your, your speech in four was, please don't recount this vote. Um, no, which is... Which is good. It's still a little, little long-winded, in, in my opinion. Uh, at TED, we like really short speeches. So I'm going to limit mine to just four words, albeit with a, with a teensy preamble, um, because, because I, I can't accept this award for, for me. It's, it's on behalf of the amazing team of TED people over there, June, and, and uh, the rest of the team who I get to work with every day. Um, and for the members of the design community who many of you here tonight who have so inspired us at TED over the years. I'm not going to try and name you because A, I'll forget someone and B, I might cry. But what, what you've taught us is kind of what I said there, that design isn't just about 
the prettification and, and functionality of, of amazing objects. It's so much bigger than that. It's pulling the camera back. It's a way of thinking that can be applied to almost anything. Um, ultimately, this human, amazing human ability to reimagine the future. And so um, with that, my, my four words, if you're, if you're ready. Now, you may think that um, with my slightly strange English accent, I, I shouldn't be saying this. But trust me, um, this isn't just about America. This is for the whole world. Are you ready? Somebody, please redesign this. Thank you. <laughs> Here to present the Architecture Award is Chicago-based artist and urban planner, Theaster Gates. Hello, everybody. What an amazing night uh, to celebrate uh, the world's design leaders. I'm honored to be here and, and to feel like a collaborator in the spirit of design that, that the creative arts at large um, help, help make this world work. I want to talk about Jeannie Gang a little bit. Um, Jeannie Gang has been a friend of mine in Chicago. And normally when people in New York think about Chicago, they, they talk a lot about old buildings that have been built. Um, they talk about the great heroes and the great parties that had happened in the 20s and 30s. I didn't live in the 20s and 30s. We have great parties in Chicago right now. And those parties often include conversations about the amazing architecture that's happening now. And Ginny Gang is at the tip of, the co of, of lips in that conversation in Chicago. She's been a mentor and friend and um, and in some ways, Studio Gang, as an, as an entity, as a unit, is helping to um, uh, help Chicago re reimagine itself in the world and helping the world to reimagine what Chicago can do. I feel like Jeannie and I have a couple things in common. One, uh, we believe in cities. We believe that cities are important and that buildings in cities are important. But I really uh, also think that Jeannie understands that people who occupy buildings are really important. Um, at, at, uh, in MoMA, uh, at MoMA, in the unhoused exhibition that we are participants in, Jeannie spent a lot of time talking about um, abandoned properties and, and foreclosure and people who were gonna lose their homes and then strategies that her firm, not just thinking about the building but about the economics of poverty, ways that her firm might actually engage the mayor of a small town near Chicago to do good things. I feel like this sister got it going on. Um, I hope you guys will um, just join me in celebrating Jeannie and listen to what she has to say on this video. I like seeing design in both big and small things, you know, from a, you know, a bridge and how it's created to small details in, in a building and I think that's a great thing about architecture it could span over those breadths between giant enormous city plans to to real touchable physical material it's not an act of just my own personal will that I'm putting on a building it has to work for people and how they use it and that's really how the building gets shaped it's you know really asking yourself those questions. How is this going to liberate the users to be able to use this building in new ways? How is it going to help the way that they work or see the world? And then, you know, you have to really understand that before jumping into the form making. Please welcome Jeannie Gang. Place the award here. Wow. Um, first, thank you, the Aster, as my friend and collaborator. It's especially meaningful that this award has been presented by you. We are absolutely thrilled to receive this award. So thank you, Caroline and the Cooper Hewitt, for the prominence that you impart on all the design um, in the National Design Awards program. It's a great opportunity 
Also to thank our clients, both the public and private clients in the public and private realms, who believed in us and who have worked together with us to make compelling projects. And also to our many collaborators, including these fabulous engineers and landscape architects, graphic designers, photographers. From the very first meeting you know, to the finished product, it's all of those with whom our design is so closely intertwined that, that I think tonight. Um, we built our office with the idea that we could create transformative environments for people um, that also resonate ecologically and culturally with a specific place. So to achieve this, it takes many talented hands and working collectively. So it makes this night especially wonderful for me is that many of us from the studio are present tonight um, to celebrate this honor together. So I want to give a big heartfelt congratulations to my, my partner, my rock, Mark Schendel, and also congratulations to my fellow much deserving collaborators and colleagues at Studio Gang with whom I share this award. Thank you very much. Presenting the Communication Design Award, please welcome Artistic Director of the Public Theater, Oscar Eustace. Thank you very much. Um, I've been working with Paula for the last eight years. I've been admiring Paula's work for the last 20 years. And so I'm gonna take the liberty of speaking about this personally because really all I'm qualified to do is to speak about Paula Scher's extraordinary work on behalf of the public theater. Plus, I'm a little bit like a cuckolded husband. I like to believe she doesn't work for anybody but us. I like to believe it's only the only thing she cares about. And she has managed to convince me and my predecessor that the public theater is the most important thing in her life. Sorry, Seymour. And that, therefore, I'm going to speak that way. I first noticed Paula's work for the public theater almost 20 years ago when I was in Los Angeles. I wasn't working for the public theater. But as soon as those ads started appearing in the New York Times, it provoked a shockwave not only in me, but in people who worked for theaters across the country because we were suddenly aware that somebody had found a visual identity for America's most important theater that was somehow both thrilling, exciting, original, and completely consonant with what that theater stood for. For the next 12 years, I irritated designers on the West Coast and later in Rhode Island where I lived by showing Paula's work to them and saying, can't you do something like this for my theater? Said I found it was a very bad way to work with designers. <laughs> um, this room knows. And finally, I decided to just stop all this nonsense, move to New York, take over the public so I could work directly with Paula. <laughs> and the experience since then has been as gratifying as I could possibly have hoped because she is an extraordinary, extraordinary visionary, a uniquely talented artist who is also a great collaborator. And that collaboration can take many different forms. There are times when we will talk about a show or we will talk about a design for a poster over and over through phone calls and meetings and trudge away and suddenly something gorgeous will emerge from it. And there's times when she calls me up and she says, shut up, I'm not showing this to anyone else, I'm sending it to you, it's what we're doing and I have learned to salute and shut up because she's always right. She understands the power and importance of history, that the, the, the identities that she creates for the public somehow stand on the shoulders of the Russian constructivists. You actually feel that enormous ferment coming of a time when it was believed that it was possible that unique and individual artistic identity could be combined with art for the public good for everybody. And in doing so, she models what the public theater believes, that doing art for everybody, doing art for the people, saying the culture belongs to everybody, is not something that inhibits individual creativity, it's something that unleashes it. And I think Paula not only believes that, her work is an extraordinary demonstration of that fact. Um, you're gonna see a video now with her talking a little bit about that. I didn't know what design was when I was in college. I had a, a, a teacher who was an illustrator. He was a Polish illustrator. His name was Stanislaw Zagorski. And he made record covers. He designed the cream cover, um, Wheels on Fire. It was the silver one. 
And that was the coolest thing on the planet to have a teacher that did that. And he, he spoke very bad English, uh, but he could show me that there was something going on that was exciting in uh, imagery and words. I went to school in the 60s and graduated in 1970, so I was um, inspired by zigzag rolling papers. I would go to antique stores and um, look at typography. So I became completely involved in this notion of expressive typography and imagery that communicated through expression. We were always told that design, graphic design, was ephemeral, that you made things and they disappeared. But I go into music stores and I still see record covers that I made and they're still for sale. And if you download Charles Mingus uh, changes one and two on your iPod, it's still my graphic. And that's 45 years old, so I guess it's not so ephemeral. Paula, could you come up and in the sight of President Gore and the rest of us accept your award? Always get someone from the theater to do your speech. I really want to thank the Cooper Hugh at the Smithsonian for honoring the most humanist profession of graphic design. Thank you for bringing that to the fore. I love being a graphic designer. It's a great profession. <laughs> this award was a little elusive to me, so it's really fantastic to be the bride. <laughs> And I'm really so thrilled to accept it in such stellar company. And what I really want to do here is simply acknowledge the people who made me a better designer. So I want to thank Mr. Zagorski for first introducing me to typography. My husband, Seymour Quast, who taught me actually how to see it and my partner, Michael Beirut, who taught me how to explain it to a client. <laughs> I'm exceptionally lucky because I'm a partner in an amazing design firm called Pentagram, and I am inspired every day by my fantastic partners, past and present, who have taught me so much and have provided the most beautiful place to work with incredible staff, incredible spirit, and this is truly a designer's utopia and I've been very fortunate for it. It made me a better designer. And lastly, I want to thank my clients because they hired me, they educated me, they fought with me, they exasperated me, they put up with me, and they even paid me. <laughs> you all made me a better designer. Thank you. Thank you for the work. Presenting the Interaction Design Award, please welcome 9-11 Memorial Museum Director, Alice Greenwald. Good evening. I am so honored to be here because Jake Barton and local projects make me feel hopeful about the 21st century. Because they're proving again and again at large scale and small that technology can make outposts of civilization more vibrant and relevant than ever. And that technology used smartly and wisely needn't be the enemy of venerable human values and deep rigorous cultural immersion. For all of local projects' fluency in digital hardware and software, their work is never just about awesome gadgetry. It's about enabling new understandings, wisdom, and delight. It's about the stories we tell each other that make meaning in our lives. At the National September 11th Memorial Museum, we have worked in partnership with Jake and his amazing team to use the latest technology to do the most fundamental thing, 
to make history personal. What they have achieved will effectively transform what we have come to expect from a museum experience, inviting us to engage history not from afar or retrospectively, but rather as fully present actors in a drama that defines the world in which we live and which continues to unfold. It's an understatement to call their remarkable work at the Cleveland Museum of Art, Gallery One, state of the art. Some have commented that what it is most analogous to is the first Star Wars movie when it came out. Unprecedented, jaw-dropping special effects in the service of grand storytelling. And much in the way Star Wars transformed cinema, the Cleveland Gallery may well be remembered as that before and after watershed in museum design. But most importantly, from my perspective, Jake is a mensch, and that's the technical word. <laughs> being a mensch isn't necessarily a prerequisite for being a great groundbreaking designer. But knowing that he is makes me even more honored to present the 2013 Smithsonian's Cooper Hewitt Award for Interactive Design to Jake Barton. The idea of collaborative storytelling really started with some of the original work I was doing in interior architecture for museums. I became obsessed with this idea, what, what if you could tap every war veteran in a World War II exhibition to tell their own story? How much more relevant and authentic would that experience be for everyone? And that was the core pitch originally to the 9-11 Memorial Museum, was this idea that we were going to take the stories from the people who literally ran out of the burning buildings, the people who made history, and use those stories to educate the other people in the museum. That it wasn't about a historian or a codified voice for the museum telling you exactly what happened, but it was really about a expression of the global witness, of the collective memory of 9-11 itself. Thank you so much. It's hard to follow those incredible words. Uh, so I have an unorthodox group that I want to thank tonight. I mean, well, I certainly want to thank the, the jury and Cooper Hewitt, and of course, uh, my family. I want to thank uh, my amazing wife, Jenny, who lent me her walk-in closet from which I started local projects. I also want to thank uh, other wife, uh, Tia, who, uh, for anyone who started a studio with somebody, knows exactly what I mean by other wife. And of course, all the uh, amazing collaborators that we've done work with, and just the incredible creative team that we have at Local Projects, many of whom are here today. Yes, but I want to thank especially to really call out our, our clients, and really all clients. Uh, clearly, a, a client is something that is one of the, the core differentiators between art and design. And, and for us, our clients have been willing to take our crazy ideas over the last decade, and they've challenged them, they've critiqued them, they've stomped on them sometimes, but sometimes they've embraced them. And by making us work harder and smarter, by making us earn their trust with better work than we originally thought was possible. We learned so much from our clients. Well, I mean, some things we learned a little faster than others, depending on the clients, and I think we also know what that means. Uh, but for us, I mean, all of the clients that are in this house, I want to say to you, thank you from all of us designers. Thank you for the amazing opportunities. Thank you. Here to present the Interior Design Award is architect, author, and magazine editor, Stanley Abercrombie. Good evening. It's a great honor to be here this evening, but I do feel a little at a disadvantage because I've never heard of these guys. <laughs> Actually, the opposite is true. I have been admiring their work since before they formed their present partnership. And in Northern California, where I now live, uh, Aidlin Darling Design and their whole team are legendary. And from this moment on, 
They are national legends. And international will come soon. In their San Francisco office, uh, they have a remarkable woodworking shop where for each job, a whole succession of study models are made, beginning with some that are so abstract, they don't represent anything remotely buildable. But they are concepts, they are ideas, they are ideals that the finished design should adopt. That's a detail of what they do, but I think that sort of character and thoughtfulness is indicative of their entire design process. They are thoughtful about their users' sensitivity to what they do and their perceptions of what they do. They are thoughtful about the site. They are thoughtful about light and shade. They are thoughtful, of course, about form and function. They are thoughtful indeed about all the environmental issues that are so critical today, especially, it seems, in California. In short, ladies and gentlemen, these guys can do it all. And more important than that, they can do it all beautifully. I think in the film we're about to see, you will see some examples of that. We have an obsession with food and wine, and we live in a virtual cornucopia of food and wine. So a lot of our work kind of revolves around that from field to table. So we have, we're doing a brewery, we're doing three wineries, a couple restaurants. restaurants. These projects feed our interest in these areas, but it also feeds uh, a fascination we have with um, designing for all the senses and designing things that are not just visual, but are tactile and they're felt, not just seen. Looking into the future, our buildings will be accountable for their performance, but what they can't lose is what Dave and I have been trying to build in our studio, which is never forget the emotional and the psychological effects of your environment and how powerful that, that it can be. Thank you, Stan, for those kind words, and thank you, Cooper Hewitt, uh, for this award. Um, I'll try not to get emotional because I only have, Josh and I each have 45 seconds, and I'm a crier, and Josh is a crier. Uh, so, um, 15 years ago, we started an office around a wood shop, and our goal was to design things that didn't just look good, but they felt good and were only fully appreciated. Uh, through human experience and the human spirit. Um, we weren't sure how that was going to turn out, uh, so it's a real honor to be here amongst the, our fellow winners tonight and also a, pr a privilege because we're really here on behalf of so many others who've made uh, this possible, um, uh, not least of which is our offices, our whole office which is here tonight. and. Um, all the builders and collaborators we work with, um, and our clients, of course. Um, on a personal note, um, I would like to thank all the mentors who taught me the virtues of optimism. Um, I would like to thank um, my wife, Michi, for being the smartest and funniest uh, designer I know. Uh, and I'll turn the table over to Josh here. Thank you. I'd first like to acknowledge um, a rock star group of designers, architects, um, who, who actually are the uh, collective within our studio who um, we took out a small business loan to bring the entire studio out here from San Francisco. Um, 
but on a more specific note, there's a core team that make up uh, the co-vision of our studio, and that is Pete Larson, uh, Michael Perry, Kent Chang, Adam Rouse, and Rosalind Cole. Um, but on a personal note, I'd like to thank my incredible wife, who is, for the last 13 years has been my rock. Um, and on uh, an even more personal note, uh, the inspiration every day is my seven-year-old son, Erez, who has uh, continually taught me to be, to be a better father, a better husband, and a better architect. Thank you all. Presenting the Landscape Architecture Award, please welcome Claire Weiss. Twenty years ago, I met Margie Ruddick, and I owe it all to a big pile of dirt. I was expanding a cottage in New Jersey, and the exca excavation for a basement produced a mountain of dirt. My architect, Stephen Harris, suggested Margie come by to see what could be done with it. She showed up with her dog, Louie. From then on, the magic began. Many stone walls and several pergolas later, I stood in an artfully laid out field of boxwoods and realized I was in paradise. Ten years later, in Cabo San Lucas, I found myself on a lot with a pile of boulders hanging off a cliff high above the ocean. Once again, Margie came to the rescue. To my delight, she left the boulders untouched and cantilevered a pool underneath them. On a drive up the Baja coast, she stopped the car and disappeared into the desert. She seemed to be gone forever, and I became worried. But Margie never gets lost. A variety of cactus arrived on site and looked as though they had always been there. I stand in the courtyard and look out at the ocean, and I am in another paradise, thanks to the artistry of that fabulous person, Margie Ruddick. I think people are going to look back at this particular time. You know, it's a really tempestuous, you know, both environmentally and socially. And I think it's going to be a very uh, important thing for people to be able to go back and say exactly what was going on here. And how is this shift from sort of formalism to, quote, sustainability, and then, you know, real community engagement, how that'll happen, and uh, what it looked like. I had a very, um, complicated relationship with sort of French formal design because in the 80s everything was sort of postmodern and I was very conflicted about it and I thought I, I turned more to Asia spent a lot of time you know doing the Living Water Park and Chengdu and Sichuan and uh, working in India and so I never went to Europe and in the last two years all of a sudden I'm back I think it's very interesting after you've kind of made your own path to kind of come back to something that is people think of as conventional and realize how radical, how deeply radical it was. It's my great honor to hand this to you, Margie. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Claire. It's very touching to have Claire actually introduce me. Thank you so much, the Cooper Hewitt. Thank you for this incredible honor, but also for recognizing the field of landscape architecture. It's about time. And um, it's a very subtle art. It involves a lot of people. And uh, I know, some of you know that my mother was an extraordinary artist. We collaborated very closely on the living, on, on the Urban Garden Room, Bank of America. And you also know that I never wanted to be an artist. I never wanted to be that person alone in a studio. 
of doing my work. And so I just really want to recognize all those people who have tethered me to a much bigger world, incredibly collaborative world. My brilliant collaborators, Stephen Harris, Lucien Reese Roberts, David Kelly, Dennis Wedlick, who I spent the most amazing day with yesterday in Miami. Our most beautiful work we've done together. I also wanted to uh, talk a little bit about our clients who bring so much to the table, their ideas, their sensibilities, even when they go shopping and bring back these really left field kind of things. It deepens our work, makes it more meaningful and really more mysterious. And I just want to thank you all for that. I also, the young people I work with are very moving to me. I'm so excited to see where they're going from Jason Bregman to uh, Ashley Young. I know where they're going is so fascinating, and I know I'm not going to go there, but I'm so happy to cheer them on. And finally, the people who make my work possible, my family and my friends, my sisters, Abby and Lisa, my kids, Celia and Jonathan, my great friends, Zuzu, Susan, Winnie, not only do you make work possible, you put up with this craziness that we do, but you also make life possible. And thank you so much, and thank you for this honor. Here to present the Product Design Award is Vice President and Creative Director of Intel Media at Intel Corporation, Simon Waterfall. Good evening. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to present the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt National Design Award for product design to New Deal Design of San Francisco and its principal and founder, Gadi Ahmed, who are sitting over there. Uh, this is the first time I've presented an award as a client, um, so I know a few of the secrets that he's had to make his uh, design a success, mainly employing young and old, talented, slightly unhinged, autistically brilliant designers, giving them the studio to work in to have free, well, free from the politics and the pressures of the outside world. One thing I did want as a first-time client, though, was basically a lot more free shit. And I, to, be, to be honest, I have nothing, nothing. No award-winning Lytro camera, no half a dozen Fitbits for my good close friends and family. He's basically as tight as a shark's ass at 50 fathoms. And he never, ever gives design away because he doesn't compromise. He never gives away those two millimeters that you think is just, oh, we should just do it. He never gives away any of the detail, the integrity. He never settles for a wrong chrome when he knows the right chrome is maybe 300 meetings away. And that is why he's a winner tonight and every night. Because every morning he gets up, he fights for those details, he fights for the insignificant, but mostly he fights for you. I just want to show you some of the battles that he's won over the last few years. There are some objects that are just traditional objects that have perfect balance of form, uh, culture, and, and, and beauty. The whole notion that um, objects that are functional should be also beautiful and the lighting is actually alien notion to a lot of people. But for me, it's always been about how this object could be warm, human, interesting visually, interesting culturally. It's not only the physicality of the object, it's also the behavior, the experience around the object, how it makes people happy. The delight of the first uh, initiation into this new uh, type of use, that's more or less the overall thread of what I've uh, been doing for the last 25 years, more or less. Ladies and gentlemen, New Deal Design, Gary Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, First, many thanks to the Cooper Yurt uh, National Design Museum and the jury for this really thrilling, amazing honor. 
I also want to thank uh, my fellow designers at New Deal, who worked really so hard uh, through the last 13 years to create this body of work that is worthy of this award. Um, I also want to say a big major thank you to the wonderful professionals that uh, joined us in bending these unwilling pieces of technology into meaningful objects of design. And above all, I want to thank my wife, Eleanor, for surviving the chaos of New Deal. Creating functional and delightful objects uh, by melding software and hardware and digital thinking is never easy in a business world seeking for uh, immediate success. And nearly all the work that New Deal is known for came to life the hard way. And with that, uh, I want to say that together with our clients, we really share some tumultuous, risky, touching moments that are all woven together into a story of refining a, a new digital reality. And that's essentially our so story. And again, thank you so much for honoring New Deal Design with this National Design Award. Thank you. Presenting the Lifetime Achievement Award, please welcome American author and journalist, Tom Wolfe. Thank you very much. Uh, this is just for context. In a word, um, it's my great honor uh, this evening uh, to present a really, really major uh, award in the design and architectural field, uh, the um, National Design Award for Lifetime uh, Achievement to, uh, to, to James Wines. Um, I had the, well, let me first say, James already has 33 national and international major awards. If this were 1873 and to an event like this you had to wear your uh, medals on your chest, they'd have to have a crane just to, uh, to, to get him up. But I happen to know from an inside source who has unique access to his mind that this means more than any other award. This is the Oscar. Uh, this, this, is, this is it. It, it's the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, it's probably a song that goes with that. But anyway, um, geez, I, don't know. I won't try, I won't try that. Um, and I had the good luck of first meeting um, James on the threshold of, his, of, of a remarkable career uh, when he, as a patron, I had two people from Richmond, Virginia, Sidney and Francis Lewis, the, the owners of Best Products. Best Products was a precursor of Costco, Walmart, and, and so on. Um, and they lived in Richmond, Virginia, and I knew them because I lived in Richmond, uh, Virginia. And so I had a, thank you, Richmond. I had a very early, uh, uh, I had a very early look at this in, uh, incredible uh, uh, career that, that was uh, about to happen. And I particularly remember um, in, giving him my own 1977 National uh, uh, Design Award when he said, I don't care if they want to build these boring glass boxes. After all, this country's built on freedom of choice. He said, but why do they have to always leave those little turds behind in the plaza? He was, he was talking about uh, sculptures such as that of Henry Moore um, <laughs> and the, uh, the, the squiggles of uh, uh, no, Noguchi, um, and uh, I think it was the first, the word turd had not entered Bartlett's familiar quotations uh, until that time. I mean, it's just a, just a side note. Um, uh, uh, but with the, in, in, in terms of uh, the best products building, these were, these were the first new buildings after modernism. Postmodernism was just a, 
a, a faint stumble away from, uh, from modernism. James Wines introduced uh, something new. He, he took buildings and he turned them into pictures, artworks, by not, by not adding anything. He never added a, a, a brick to these big commercial buildings. Um, he simply rearranged them a bit. Uh, he was famous for the, uh, the, these are commercial buildings, you know, they're, they're big brick uh, boxes. Uh, he, he, peeled off the, uh, he peeled off the side of, of the bricks on one side so that they were, they looked like a piece of paper folded over this way. One of my favorites uh, was the Notch uh, building in Sacramento, California. The Notch building, the 14 foot height, 14 foot high corner was on a, unbeknownst when you just looked at the building uh, at the beginning of the day uh, to people, um, that detached from the building itself, not cleanly, but with bricks uh, as if they had all just been pried loose from one another. And that was your entrance to the building. Um, this was, uh, nothing like this had ever, had ever been uh, seen before. Uh, in sight, uh, James's organization, I mean, if I'm not, I hope I'm not mistaken, um, sculpture in the environment. So the E in sight is for environment. And to, to James, that was not only a kind of political and, and moral purpose for looking after the environment, but it became a design uh, element. And in uh, Richmond, Virginia, um, is one of his great uh, best product stores, uh, the Forest Building. It was, the building was built in a grove of trees, um, and the entrance, um, you go through the, the front entrance, was surrounded by trees, and you found yourself in a forest. There's no, there was no roof. Uh, and you had to walk 30 feet through the forest to get to the showroom. Um, and uh, the, these, things were these things were tremendously um, not only popular, but they were, uh, they worked, financially worked terribly well for these, uh, uh, for these uh, companies. Best products, uh, income absolutely soared. Uh, remind me of Bill Condren, who owned uh, Strike the Gold, which won the 1991 uh, Kentucky Derby. Um, he, he said, Bill Condren said, I'm old and I'm too fat, but I still know where the rice bowl is. And, uh, and sure enough, the, the Lewises, Sidney and Francis Lewis, knew where the rice bowl was. They, they, they profited enormously uh, from James Wine's uh, uh, genius. Um, and in fact, I think there was someone who made up the saying, or, or James used to call the, uh, the turds in the plaza plop art. Um, and, uh, and so there was a saying um, their eyes pop, uh, their, arrows, their arrows pop when they see the plop, and then they go shop shop. Because um, uh, a lot of literature built into, into all of this. And, and I, then he also uh, did the, this shows his, his love of the environment, the great Vertiscape building in Mumbai, uh, India. The Vertiscape building is a the most unusual co-op building ever built. God only, I would wish that New York had a few of these. The, the, the uh, Vertiscape building consists of six, not apartments, but yards with grass and shrubbery um, attached to a central pole that provides all of the electricity, the plumbing, all the sort of guts of the house. But you, on all four sides, you have a yard, you, have, you can arrange any way uh, you want, and then there's a huge yard on the top, that's like the penthouse. Um, it, 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 as I say, it's in Mumbai, um, India, and James's uh, uh, projects have been all over the world, and to this day they're all over the world because he always brings something absolutely new, fresh, and absolutely appropriate. 
uh, to, to, what he is, uh, uh, to what he's done. Uh, so I couldn't be happier, and I couldn't be taken back more wonderfully to old Virginia um, than to be able to present um, to James tonight uh, an award that I know means more to him than any other award he could get, the National <coughs> uh, Design Award. Come forth, James. <laughs> <laughs> When you really want to get into doing something creative, you sort of step outside the academic definition of your profession, whatever it is, and you find sources that are that can invade and make it more interesting. I love Duchamp and that statement he made, well, I'm non-retinal. He didn't mean you couldn't see it. It just meant that he was rejecting a lot of the kind of tactile, painterly, you know, traditional qualities you associate with that profession. So over the years, we've done things that obviously abandon what the formalist architect or the stylist architect would would do. I think of all works of art I really love, that I really you know, admire. And um, it's really kind of not so much what it is, but what it makes you think about. But I think it was uh, Jean Cocteau who said, well, they, when you first start out, they try to bury you by ignoring you, and then you get a little foothold and they try to bury you with the criticism and then you get a little bit famous and they try to bury you by saying your old hat and it goes on and on. It says, finally, all else failing, they try to bury you with honors. <laughs> so maybe I was at that phase here. They're trying to bury me one more time. <laughs> All right, let me get here. I realize I have this uh, 90 seconds, but just mobile, getting mobilized to the stage has already used up my time, so <laughs> I'll, good heavens. Well, certainly, uh, catch my breath here. Um, part of this great honor is being introduced by Tom Wolfe, a longtime friend and, of course, one of the most perceptive writers of all time in this country with a great edge and great insight. <laughs> Give him a hand. <laughs> Actually, I have to apologize him, to him tonight because um, in order to coerce him to do this, I, I told him, well, you know, if you don't do it, Tom, uh, the Cooper Hewitt's going to get Kim Kardashian or Lindsay Lohan. <laughs> And he really got very nervous. He says, okay, James, I'll do it, I'll do it. He said, it, it would take so long uh, to bring them up to speed in ar 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 architectural discourse. You know, so. Anyway, uh, I am terribly honored by this, but one thing I would like to comment on, because I think it would have made the great speech of the night, uh, is the indefatigable team that puts it tonight together during this shutdown of the government. There were amazing people. I mean, you have Carolyn Bauman, Vasil Janopoulos, May Ma, Carolyn Payson, David Rios, and all of their colleagues who, give them a huge hand, really. <laughs> you know, my big hand. They've been working out of Starbucks for two weeks. So you can imagine what that's been like. In fact, I want to propose to the Smithsonian that they dedicate a new Mount Rushmore, some big mountainside in which they take all of the faces of these hero heroes of the Cooper Hewitt and grave it on a mountain. <laughs> uh, I hope you'll all support that. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I am deeply, deeply grateful for this honor. It's just a pinnacle moment in my life. Um, while I'm up here, I certainly have to thank a few people. They always do it in Hollywood, so I'm going to do it too. Uh, my long-suffering daughter, who's a wonderful architect in New York. Uh, my even more long-suffering wife, uh, both an artist and someone who has supported and endured my uh, idiosyncrasies all these years. Uh, and, as a, and then finally, of course, I, I want to thank all of my clients 
Uh, one exceptional one is here tonight in the form of Danny Meyer and David Swinghammer of Shake Shack, of course. <laughs> and uh, then finally, I want to thank Denise Lee, my associate at SITE, who is remarkable, works till two in the morning, and deserves a huge applause. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Okay, I think I have to. Again, do I have to come? Presenting the People's Design Award, please welcome designer Todd Oldham. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be with you all, especially after the last week we endured with the government BS at our door. But, you know, we rose to the occasion, and uh, this team is just extraordinary. So it's a real pleasure to be celebrating so many beautiful people that believe that design fixes everything. Um, I'm especially honored tonight because I get to present the People's Design Award. Um, it's a thrill because it's actually chosen by the public. Uh, often not the best idea, but in this case, a very, very, very good idea. <laughs> this past month, tens of thousands of people have cast their votes at Smithsonian.com. I won't keep you in any suspense any longer. This year's winner is Pack H two O by Greif. <laughs> More than one billion people around the world live each day without access to clean water in their homes. Unfortunately, more than three million people die of this each year. Designed to make it easier and safer for people in water-stressed regions and disaster zones to carry water to their homes, this pack H2O solves this problem one pack at a time. Now let's see how. In the scorching heat, a mother in Haiti walks four miles each way to collect water. In Kenya, a woman carries water on her head, weighing an agonizing 40 pounds. This scene is repeated over and over again by millions of people every day. The majority of those millions are women, and their lives are often defined by this daily struggle to collect water for their families. It's grueling, painful work and can severely affect a woman's quality of life. To further add to the misery, many of those who need to walk long distances to collect water are also forced to use containers that once contained dangerous chemicals. Carrying water like this can lead to severe spinal problems and chronic pain. So Greif developed a solution to go from this to this. The Greif Water Backpack is the answer to ease the burden of water transport for women and children around the world. The water backpack is comfortable to wear, so greatly reduces the risk for neck and spine injuries. And being more comfortable, it speeds up the transit time between the water source and home. This is Marlene. She lives in rural Haiti in a village where Greif constructed a rainwater catchment system. This solved a big problem for the villagers. They now have a source of fresh water. But Marlene and her neighbors still faced a long walk home with heavy buckets on their heads. But not anymore. Marlene has a water backpack and can safely and comfortably carry water to her home. Join me in welcoming CEO of Greif, David Fisher. Thank you all. And Todd, yes, they did pick the best uh, award tonight. So I want to take a few moments and thank the Cooper Hewitt uh, organization for recognizing our product and uh, thank all the people who have voted for us in this contest. It's quite a humbling moment, particularly after listening to the string of truly gifted design folks who have uh, crossed this stage here tonight. I also want to thank uh, the folks at the Clinton Global Initiative, uh, particularly Greg Milne, who's here tonight, who got us involved about four or five years ago in the wa global water crisis using the strength of our global manufacturing footprint to make a difference. Greif, uh, I'm blessed to work for Greif. Um, it's the fourth oldest publicly traded company in America, founded in 1877, founded upon the golden rule, and has over 100 years of history of giving back. 
And uh, that combination with the like-minded people, the Clinton Global Initiative unleashed uh, the, the, the work that led to the Water Backpack, which is now in 20 countries, affecting the lives of hundreds of thousands of women and children, and we're just getting started. I want to also thank our good partners uh, who operate with us in the poorest regions of the world. Dr. Paul Farmer, a good friend of mine from Partners in Health. Uh, Elizabeth Blake, who's the Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel of Habitat for Humanity International, and Bill Horn, who is uh, the leader for Operation Blessing. These three folks have forgotten more about saving the world than I'll ever know. And one of the key thoughts I want to leave with you tonight is design helps everyone. Design helps the richest and most wealthy countries in the world, and it also can change the lives of the poorest among us. In fact, it not only changes their lives, it can save their lives. Good design matters at the base of the pyramid, and I appreciate, again, the Cooper Hewitt Award to recognize that. Lastly, as you drive home tonight and you think about tomorrow, think about this, that there are over one billion people in the world who tomorrow will have to fetch their water and fetch it and take it home and feed it to their family. And that one billion people, just to put it in perspective, is about 1.66 million times the population of our dinner tonight. And they're going to haul water home in arduous, difficult conditions. And there's fantastic work going on in the world generating more clean water sources for the poorest among us. But it's all for naught if the Achilles heel exists in the chain. And we have to think about this as a system. And that Achilles heel is the contaminated, discarded containers. They haul water home to their children and their families. And the PAC is designed to solve that problem around the world. And if you're of like mind, please join our cause. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Caroline Bowman. Go People's Design Award and Package 2.0. Fantastic. Thank you. What a spectacular evening. Thank you all for being part of the Cooper Hewitt family and community. We look forward to celebrating you, with you next year at the 15th anniversary of the National Design Awards. We look forward to welcoming you to the new Cooper Hewitt next fall. This is the design party of the year, so stick around, celebrate the winners, and enjoy one another. Thank you so much.